Hi, my name is Dan Prine. I'm the pastor here at Edgewater United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for coming and checking out our website. We're so glad that you're here. Uh, it's my prayer for you that you have an opportunity to get a chance to come and, and experience what life is like here at Edgewater, to get a chance to, to, to connect with other people, but most importantly, to connect with God. We're kind of a come as you are kind of place. We meet in a, in a movie theater setting and, and we would really look forward to getting a chance to be uh, your church home. And so we hope to see you soon. All right, well, this morning we are finishing our series called Guardrails. Essentially, we've taken this idea of this uh, kind of everyday thing. We see them out there all the time of a, a guardrail, and we've taken and we've tried to make a spiritual principle out of it. We all basically know what a guardrail is, that a guardrail is a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous or off-limits areas. Um, the, the guardrail, remember, we've always said this, is, a, is placed away from the edge of danger, uh, a few feet, a few yards away from the edge of danger, um, guardrails are designed so that there may be just a slight bit of impact, maybe a little bit of damage that comes from hitting the guardrail, but that prevents a massive amount of damage from what may happen that's on the other side. Uh, because we all know that on the other side of the guardrail, those are places that we, that we shouldn't go, the things we need to avoid. So we asked the question a few weeks ago, what would it look like to have guardrails in other areas of our lives? What would it look like, we talked about last week, to have financial guardrails? What would it look like to have moral guardrails? Uh, what would it look like to have gar guardrails when it comes to our friendships and our marriage, academically, professionally? It could go in any area of life. And so what if we were to establish these guardrails that would keep us back from the edge of disaster? And so here's kind of the definition that we've been using for these kind of guardrails. And that would be that a guardrail is a personal standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience. Okay, so that you would say, in this area of my life, this is as far as I'm going to go. Okay, and you might make that decision so personally and so strongly that, that when you come up against that area and, and you get to that place that, that all of a sudden the, the alarms would go off and you'd be like, warning, warning, you're headed to a place that you know you shouldn't go. There, there's danger ahead. Okay, and now that, that, that standard may not be the standard that anyone else around you uses. They may not draw a line at all. They may not draw a line where you draw it. Um, and, and, but it's a personal standard that you're so committed to that maybe you begin to feel a little bit guilty when you bump up against it because it's violating that personal standard. But the thing is, is that it, there are fewer consequences when you violate here than as opposed to when you, when you run into trouble over there. So, so by doing so, by drawing that guardrail back a little bit further, it keeps us from danger. So because we've said every single week that our culture is drawing us that direction, our culture is baiting us to the edge of disaster, and then it mocks us when we step over certain lines. Our culture baits us to the edge of disaster financially, where it's saying, hey, come on, buy, 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 buy now, uh, zero down, no one's ever going to call you, and then you end up getting in debt, and the culture goes, wow, that sure was irresponsible of you, and no one's going to want to marry you, you're such a loser, Okay. Uh, and you're like, wait, I was just doing what, what, what everybody else is doing. I was just doing what the culture was drawing me to. We, we've talked about all sorts of areas. We've talked about finances and moral guardrails and in our friendships. Uh, but today as I wrap up this series, I want to talk about what some of the, the pushback may be that you've experiencing. I want to, I want to talk about that. Um, if, if you've missed some of these along the lines, I encourage you to get online, edgewaterchurch.com, our YouTube channel, something like that, to get caught up in these, these messages so you know what it is that we're talking about. Um, but, but chances are, if you've been here, you've kind of fallen into one of two ways in thinking about this. 
The, the first way of thinking about this is, boy, I sure am glad my wife was here to hear this. Or I sure am glad my husband was here to hear this. Or, or I sure am glad my kids, you know, I'm going to send the link to my grandkids. I'm going to bookmark this page so that, so that down the road my grandkids can get a chance to hear this. Because it just takes, it, it's common sense what we've been talking about. It's common sense to step away from the edge of disaster. I mean, you think about it in all other areas of your life. When you're driving, when you're hiking, you're, you're not trying to see how close you can get to falling off the 100-foot cliff. You're, you're taking a step back so that you're in a place of safety. So, so that's, that's one way of thinking. The other way is that you've gone through all this and you've, you said, you know, I'm not going to do this. I, I, I don't, I don't want to do this. Yeah, Dan, it makes sense. I mean, it's all logical what you're talking about with, with all of this. And I mean, but, but there's something in us that says, okay, I've got it. But the problem with the guardrail is that it's keeping me from getting what I want. Okay, because, because I want that over there. Okay, I, I don't want to be a good example. I, I, ju- I just want to make all the money I can. Okay, I, I don't want to give. I want to buy. I, I don't want to be wise and prudent. I want to date her or I want to date him. Okay, I, I don't want to be fiscally responsible. I want to lease that convertible Mustang over there. I mean, that, you know, so, so maybe that's some of the pushback you've been experiencing. And, and that's why many of you, you may, you may have liked this series a little bit, uh, but you walk out of here and you do what you've always done. And, and the reason is, again, not because the logic is flawed in what we've been talking about. Again, you're hoping that everybody around you is paying attention. You hope that your friends and family are listening to this. You're, you're going to save this for your kids and grandkids. But the problem is, is that when it comes to you and when it comes to me, the whole idea of stepping back means that there are things between where I am and where I, where I shouldn't be that, that, I'm, that maybe I'm missing out on. Remember we said the guardrail is actually placed in that place of safety. And so you could drive there in the same way. Th- these are maybe some things that, that you could do and not cause complete disaster in your life. And so maybe you're thinking, you know, I'm, I, I'm missing out on something. I, I'm not as close to the edge of sinning as I, as I would want to be. There, there are some experiences that I've left unexplored. I'm not having maybe as much fun as I really feel I should have. So, so honestly, Dan, that's great, all that you've been talking about. I'm just not going to do it. So if you've had, if you've had those thoughts, uh, and you've already maybe wandered in that direction... This morning, I want to I tell you a couple things you already know, because that's normally what I do up here. I just tell you something you already know. And then I want to tell you a story from the Bible, okay? So if you decided, you know, that guardrail thing, that's just, that's just ridiculous. I'm missing out on too much. I would rather live on the edge. Uh, I'd rather live dangerously, however it is that you view it. Here's the thing that you need to know. Is that regardless of whether you have guardrails or not, the tension that you feel is not going away. Okay? Whether you have guardrails or not, the tension that you feel is not going away. Because remember, here's what happens. We, we've said that, that we would all agree that, that somewhere out there, morally, relationship-wise, uh, professionally, financially, all of us agree that there's some line out there that we shouldn't cross. We, we, we may not agree on where that is, but we would agree that, you know, a, a person shouldn't do that. A married person shouldn't do that. A single person shouldn't do that. A student shouldn't do that. There are lines out there. But here's the problem. It's that wherever you decide to put the brakes on, whether you put them way back here or up here or up here, wherever you put the brakes on, that is where you will experience the tension and the temptation. That's where where your temptation begins as soon as you stop moving towards the edge. There's always that temptation to do more. The temptation is not going away. The tension that you feel is not going away. If you decide, well, you know, just forget this diet I've been on. I'm, I'm just going to eat whatever I want to eat. Somewhere you're going you're gonna to have to stop or you're going to pop one of those. And, uh, it, it, but there's always going to be a point of tension. It's kind of like the, uh, the, the menu at Wendy's. Okay, you say, you know, I really probably shouldn't eat there. It's fast food and I know it's bad for me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it. And so, so you got a single. And, and you eat that single and, and you say, wow, that, that was good. But then next time you go, you look at the menu and what's right below that? The double. And, and, then, and then you say, well, you know, okay. And you eat that. And then, and then what, what do you know? The next time you go, what's below that? The triple. You know? And I bet you if they had a quadruple on the menu, there would be some of us that would go and say, yes, please, and I'll have mine with extra cheese. Okay? And now they go and do the, 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 the Baconator. I mean, come on. That's just unfair. But um, so, so there's always something else. No matter where you put the brakes... There's always going to be something else that is tempting you a little bit further. 
Going back to what we talked about um, uh, last week with the, the relationship thing. Again, refusing to have guardrails. It doesn't eliminate the tension. doesn't eliminate the, the temptation. It just erodes your, dissolve, your resolve. It dissolves your resolve. It, and it brings you to a place that, that, uh, that if you were to give in, the consequences are, are bigger. Like last week, we talked about the relationship thing. Or, or two weeks ago. And I suggested it as a guardrail. Again, it's not in the Bible, but it, but, uh, it was just a, a helpful suggestion that probably as a guardrail, maybe married people shouldn't have... Uh, a meal alone with someone of the opposite sex that's not their spouse. Just, it's, it just leads to things. So, so that's sort of a guardrail. So what if my guardrail is, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up this guardrail at I shouldn't have coffee with someone of the opposite sex who's not my wife. I, I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't do that. But, you know, I really want to have coffee with her. And I really want to. And I really, okay, I'm going to. And, and, and I have coffee with her. What, 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 what happened? Well, I had coffee with her. It wasn't the end of the world. But what if my guardrail wasn't there? What if my guardrail was a little further in and I said, well, I'm not going to have dinner with someone of the opposite sex who's not my spouse. And, and, but, you know, I really want to have dinner with her. Really, I want to have dinner with her, but I don't, you know, and then I do. What's the worst thing that happened? Well, I had dinner with her. Okay. But what if that's not where I had put my guardrail? What if I put my guardrail at, I shouldn't go over to her house. Okay. I shouldn't go over to her house. I really shouldn't go over to her house. But, you know, she wants me to come over to her house, and, and I want to go over to her house, and so I go over to her house. You can see how the, the consequence is getting closer to the edge. It's getting more and more dangerous. And so what if I put my guardrail then at, well, I really shouldn't go upstairs. I shouldn't go upstairs. She really wants to, I'm going to stop the example after this, just so you know. Um, I really shouldn't go upstairs. I shouldn't go upstairs, but I want to get, okay, you see how it's just getting closer and closer to the edge of danger. And to, to the point where, I mean, if I make one misstep when my guardrail's back here, okay, the, no biggie, I can reset and restart. If I take one misstep when my guardrail was over here, I could change my life forever. I, I, I could wreck my life, okay? So, so you have to be ready to, to make that decision. And it's not just in that area. Academically, professionally, morally, anything like that, it applies everywhere. So the point is, wherever you put your foot on the brake, Wherever you do, that's where your temptation is going to begin. Okay, because there's going to be temptation everywhere along the lines. But the further you are in on things, the more complicated and dangerous the consequences are. And, and, the, and the more you say yes, the harder it is to say no. So, so refusing to have guardrails isn't the answer. It's not going to solve anything because somewhere along the line you're going to put the brakes on and that's where temptation is going to be. But what happens is you're just moving the battle line closer and closer a disaster. Okay, let me say it a different way. And that's this, is that your appetites are never fully and finally satisfied. Your appetites are never fully and finally satisfied. You will never have the meal to end all meals. You will never have the dessert to end all desserts. You will never have the kiss to end all kisses. You will never have the car purchase to end all car purchases. Okay, because you know what happens to it. When you have an appetite, what happens when you feed it? It grows. It wants a little bit more next time. And so here's the deal. Whatever we're talking about, financially, uh, shopping, debt-wise, um, relationships with people that you probably shouldn't have relationships with, alcohol, drugs, what, you, you pick the area. The point is this. Every time you feed an appetite, it's never fully and finally satisfied. It comes back and it wants more. And, and that's never going to change in life. Okay, well, if that's the case, then, then what's the smart thing to do? It's to, to, to step back. What does common sense say? To, to step back. Because if moving closer and closer and closer to lines that spell disaster, if that only feeds an appetite, then, then the thing with the guardrail is to draw back from that line of temptation to, to a different place, to where the appetite is more manageable and the consequences aren't so extreme if you do happen to violate it. Because those appetites are never fully and finally satisfied. Okay? So if you decide that the problem with having a guardrail is that it's keeping me from good things, it's keeping me from having fun, it's kind of weird, none of my friends have it, my friends aren't going to understand, I, I understand what you're talking about. Because, I mean, I've, I've, I've done it in my own life as well. All I'm saying is don't deceive yourself. Okay, remember, that's where we started this series. We said, don't, don't deceive yourself by thinking that by saying yes, 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 that you're never going to have to say no. 
Be, because, and, and, and that where you say no, that's where your temptation begins. And, and I'm just telling you this because I love you and I want God's best for you. It, is that the further you stay back from certain lines, the easier it is to resist. Okay? So let me tell you a little story. Um, it's about 605 B.C. and there's a king, maybe you've heard the name before, of Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar. He was located in, in what's modern day Iraq. And uh, he, he was bent on conquering as much as he could. And, and he was set on conquering Israel, specifically the city of Jerusalem. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, had this really kind of brilliant strategy. What he did is every time he went in to, to conquer folks, he didn't come in and just wipe them out completely. What he did is he went in and he told his officers to, to actually like capture the royal family, capture the best of the best of the people and, and, and bring them back to Babylon. And, and then what they would do is they would kind of begin to change them. They would, they would change the way they look. They would change their name. They would change their, their eating habits, change their schedule, all of these things. And, and now the, the, the best and the brightest then, of course, would be the smartest folks. Uh, a lot of times they would be the royal family because they're the ones who are the best taken care of. Um, they, they had eaten the best. They had the best health. They were the prettiest people. And so, so basically then he was collecting the best specimens from all across the world and then kind of indoctrinating them into being Babylonian. He would kind of wipe away their culture, wipe away their identity, um, and, and, then, and then recreate them in this mode of being a Babylonian and then kind of send them back out to spread Babylonian culture. So in 605 BC, he sends his armies into Jerusalem. He conquers Jerusalem, um, kind of destroys Solomon's temple, clears out all the gold and, and gets rich off of it all. And, and he brings back with him Israel's best and brightest. And four of those people, their names again you might have heard of, the first one is Daniel, and then the other three uh, went by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right, now, now they were part of this entourage that were captured and brought back to the city of Babylon. And so he gets these guys together with, with these people from all over the world, and he begins this training process. And the goal, again, is to strip away all of their heritage, to strip away all of their belief system, and create new Babylonians that, again, were the best and brightest in the world. And here's how the story starts off in Daniel chapter 1, verse 5. Where it says, The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. So they were to be trained for three years. This was kind of like graduate school for them. Hey, you thought you were smart before. You're going to get your master's now. You're going to get your Ph.D. And, and we're going to give you three years free of all this training, and, and you're going to get a food allowance of food from the king's table. So in other words, I could imagine that all those captives were probably like high-fiving each other because they saw what had happened to everybody else. Everybody else got killed. Everybody else got enslaved. And yet here they were. They were going to get a chance to eat like the best food in the world right there from the king's table. And, and, and so they were like, man, this is unbelievable. And then after they finished their, their three-year program, they would go and maybe live in the palace and serve the king. And so that was as good as it would get in, in that ancient world. But Daniel was a smart guy. And, and he saw through the plan. He kind of saw the end game. He saw where all of this was headed. And he knew what it was about to happen because he knew that once he was captured and brought into this program, they gave him a new set of clothes. They shaved his head. They pierced his ear. They changed his name. Um, he was no longer Daniel. Um, he was called Belteshazzar. Uh, Bel was one of the Babylonian gods. And then if you put kind of the rest of their, their language after that, it basically means uh, Bel will protect you. Bel will provide for you. Bell will watch over you. So they, they gave him a completely new name even. And then Daniel realized what was going on. He knew that slowly, 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 they were going to begin to strip away everything that he had believed, everything that he knew, everything that he had placed his faith in. And then one day he'd wake up and he'd be Babylonian, pretty much. And that he might be worshiping Babylonian gods, that he'd be taking part in Babylonian rituals to, to Marduk or Bell, one of the other gods. And, and then he, that he would just give up on everything that he had known was true. And this was, but this was just going to happen slowly, slowly over time. Daniel recognized something that maybe sometimes we miss out when it comes to the way we kind of get caught up in the flow of culture. And that is this, is the compromise does not erase the tension, it only weakens our resolve. Compromise doesn't erase the tension. When we're in that moment of temptation and tension and we're like, okay, man, if I just give in, then, 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 then the, there will be that, that release. There won't be the pressure anymore. 
There won't be the tension. But Daniel knew better than that. The compromise doesn't erase the tension. It only weakens our resolve. Once you cheat, it's easier to cheat a second time. Once you cross certain lines of debt, it's easier to take on more debt. Once you compromise with alcohol or drugs, it's easier the second time. That second cigarette is way easier than the first one. There there are so many lines that once you cross them, the tension doesn't go away. It's just that your resolve is lessened. And Daniel saw this and he realized, he said, man, they've, they've changed my clothes, they've changed my name, they've changed my habits, they've changed my schedule. And, and, and I realize where this is going. That one day I will have completely abandoned everything that I have held near and dear. And so Daniel decided to do something that I encourage all of us to do. And here's what scripture tells us in, in Daniel 1.8. It says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Another translation says, Daniel made up his mind. He made up his mind. He put up a guardrail. He said, this is as far as I go. This, this is as close as I get. This is as far as you're going to be able to push me. And, and, and the cool thing is, looking at it from our perspective, we know how Daniel's story ended. If you've been to Sunday school, you know it ends up, it ends up pretty good for Daniel. Um, this is the challenge for you and me, though. Daniel made up his mind before he knew how the story ended. Daniel made up his mind, and he had not even read the book of Daniel yet. Okay? You know? Um, it, he, he was a teenager, away from home, surrounded by the most powerful people in the world. And, and he knew that by saying no, there was a distinct possibility that he could lose his life. And, and, and if you look at it, you look at that verse, how, how does he describe the best food in the world at that point? He said it would defile him. Can you imagine saying that to them? You, you know, that food will defile me. And they'd probably like, be like, who do you think you are? I mean, there are people in the city who don't have any food, and you're snubbing your nose at the best food in the world? You're saying it's going to defile you? What an insult to Nebuchadnezzar and his whole kingdom. Who do you think you are? But he made a decision because before he knew the end of the story. But let me t- tell you why he made a decision before he knew the end of the story. He made the decision because he could predict the end of his story if he didn't make that decision. He knew where it was headed. He saw the writing on the wall. He knew where it was going. He knew where that road would lead. I mean, maybe in your life, there's some areas that the road that you're heading down, you know, you know where it's going. You've been there before. You don't want to go there again. And, and so Daniel made up his mind. Okay, so he asked that chief official for permission. He, he said, hey, look, me and my friends, we don't, we don't want to eat this food or drink this drink. Um, and, and, I, and I know it may be a problem, but we just don't want to do it. And then look at the next verse in Daniel 1, 9. Starts off, first two words there. Now God. Let me hear you say, now God. Now God. You, you see, as you're evaluating your guardrails, and you're saying, well, am I going to do this? I really feel like I'm kind of missing out. People are going to think I'm crazy. The guys at work are going to go like, what? What What do you mean you're not going to do this? You've always, you've always drank, you, you, you always drank that. Okay? How, wherever this lands for you. The problem is, if you think about your life, if you think about your future, what people are going to think, the things that you feel that you're going to miss out on, and this kind of stuff goes in through your mind, you're, not, you're forgetting this, this now God part. Daniel didn't forget the now God part. The now God part is that God will use the guardrails not just to simply protect you, but also to direct you. If, if you were here for the first week, you remember, we talked about that the guardrails are there to protect and direct us. Okay, And so that, that his decision to, to draw a line in the sand, to say this far and no further, God used that decision to direct his entire life. If he had not made this decision, we wouldn't be standing here today telling this story. We would be missing a book out of the Bible called Daniel. You'd probably be calling me Pastor Belteshazzar, because my name wouldn't be Daniel. So, And I'm glad. That's hard to spell. So... Um, um, So everything, more than you can possibly even imagine, hinged on his decision of whether or not to eat the food and drink the drink. And the fact that he said no, God said, okay, this is a defining moment for you, Daniel. I'm going to direct your entire future based on this decision to follow me. And I would imagine if we went around this room, for those who maybe have been following Jesus for a while, maybe you have kind of a similar story that you would say, you know, the place where I received the most direction 
from God. It wasn't in that moment that I prayed, oh God, please direct my life. But it was in that moment of trial. It was in that moment of temptation. It was in that moment of tension when, when, I, when I made a decision and, and then, and then God, God took that. They, they would look back at that and say, it was that decision. I wasn't trying to make a directional decision with my life. I was just making an ethical or moral decision. And God, God, said, and, and God used it to completely redirect my life. Relationship-wise, uh, in my friendships, academically. I never would have met my wife had, had I continued going that other direction. And, and, and God used that to make a difference for you. Not only to protect, but to direct you as well. And Daniel had no idea what hung in the balance of that decision. And let me tell you what, you have no idea what, what hangs in the balance of you deciding to put some guardrails in your life. You think you do, but you don't. Okay? My, my hunch is that for many of you, that decision, whether it's uh, how you work, um, how you do your relationships, the money thing, whatever it is, that, that decision will be a defining moment for you. That you'll look back on that and you'll say, man, you know, because I made that decision, God not only uh, protected me, because guardrails are about protection, but, but I feel like God directed or redirected my entire life because I made up my mind. So that verse goes on after the now God. It says, now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. And so, so God had been working behind the scenes, even in the life of that official, to, to, to have favor toward Daniel and his friends. So even while Daniel was making his decision, God was working in the background. God was still present in all of it, working things out. And, but the official says, hey, you know, I really like you guys, but I, I can't do this. Because, you see, I, I, I'm responsible to the king. And if, you, if your health goes down, my health is going to go down a lot because the king's going to kill me. Okay, and so so I really can't do that. I can't help you at all. And I don't know anyone who might be able to help you. And he kind of the security guard that's over there watching over him. He kind of directs them in in his direction. And so they talk to the security guard and they're like, hey, you look, you know, we we, just give us a try. Let's do it for 10 days. And, And if in 10 days we're sickly and weak. We'll talk about it again in 10 days. But but just give us 10 days. Let us give it a try. And so they did. And so. Ten days later, they are healthier than all the rest of the people. They are smarter than all the rest of the people. Here's kind of what happened in Daniel 1.17. It says, to, to these four men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel can understand various uh, visions and dreams of all kinds. God honored their decision. And, and then here's the conclusion in uh, Daniel 1.19, where it says... Uh, the king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. Those last three names, those are actually the Hebrew names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, so this was the beginning of a journey that would make a big difference over the, for the whole people of Israel. I mean, the book of Daniel, all that stuff that you read about the lion's den and the fiery furnace, all of this happened after this decision. This place to draw the line to say, you know what? I can't stretch any further. That's as far as I go. I'm going to make up my mind before I know the end of the story because I know if I don't make up my mind, I know where the story is going to end. And so here's the challenge for you and for me. You've got to make up your mind to do this. And to refuse to establish guardrails, it's not going to remove the tension and the temptation. It's just going to erode your ability to say no. And, and you know that. You've experienced it before. But you, you have to make up your mind. And you have to make up your mind before you know the end of your story. Because if you don't, I, I know you can predict where it is you're headed. If you know you're headed in a rough direction, you know where that road ends. Maybe your marriage is moving in a bad direction. Maybe your finances are moving in a bad direction. Your relationship with a son or a daughter are moving in a bad direction. Because maybe you won't draw a line in terms of how much work you work and how many days a month you travel. At some point, as you predict your own future, and for many of you it's not that difficult, it all comes down to, are you going to make up your mind? Let me just go ahead and tell you this, like we've talked about before, culture's not going to help you. You're not going to find the answer out there anywhere. Okay, because all, all they're doing, they're trying to reel you in just a little bit closer to the edge of, of danger. No one's going to help you put up those boundaries. You have to make that decision to say, this is where I go, 
and no further. Tell you what, you can change all these other things about me, but, but this is as far as I go. And because not having guardrails doesn't remove the tension. It, it just move, moves the line of, of where you're going to experience the tension, either right at the edge of disaster or maybe back in a place that's a little safer. So I want to share this verse from Proverbs, and then, then we'll wrap up. This verse kind of summarizes. Solomon said this in Proverbs 11.3. Where it said, the integrity of the upright guides them. Okay, so those decisions that we make guide us and direct us. Because here's the thing. You have no idea what God wants to do through you. I mean, they're, they're, all of us have a call on our lives for what God has in store. Maybe some of you, maybe God has a call for you to be in ministry. For you to be a pastor. For you to be some kind of involved in some kind of ministry. And, and maybe God has put that on your heart and maybe you've kind of pushed it away and pushed it away. Oh no, you don't really mean me. But you don't know what God has in store for you. You've got tremendous potential. God, God created you and he loves you and he has a plan for your life. You can't even imagine what God wants to do through you. And I'm telling you, you will never know until you do what Daniel did. And, until you make up your mind and say, you know what, in this area, that's as far as I go. That's it. And, and I'm telling you, God will take that maybe ethical or moral decision that you make and, and maybe use that to decision to direct the rest of your life. But you've got to make up your mind. Because, you know, we, we've already said, we said from the beginning that, that some of, if not all of our greatest regrets that we've had in life are, could have been avoided if we had had guardrails. But you know what that means? That means that future regrets can be avoided altogether. If you just put up some guardrails, we can't change anything from the past, but you know what? We can change some stuff for our future. We can make it so that we don't have any more of these regrets when we look back on our life. And so you resolve in your heart, just like Daniel. You say, that's it for me, regardless of what anyone else around me says or does. That's where I'm drawing my line. And I, I want that for you so much because, because I've, I've seen the wreckage of disaster. I've, I've experienced in my own life the wreckage of disaster. And, and I just want you to be able to avoid it. Again, you can't change those things in your past, but your future can hold tremendous promise if you'll just do that. And because and God's going to honor you then where you are, even in the midst of your, your, your job, your school, your neighborhood, your group of friends, whatever. God's going to honor that decision and, and then use you to impact those surroundings but you have to make up your mind to refuse to be deceived by the lie that that refusing to make up your mind that somehow the tension is going to go away the temptation is going to stop the only thing that goes away without guardrails is your resolve your strength and, and on the other side of those decisions life gets more complicated and the consequences get harder so my prayer for you is that you make up your mind Let's pray together. God, thank you for this time today that we can gather and, and uh, be with you and hear from you. And God, I pray that you just give us the strength that we need to be able to make some of these decisions that keep us where we need to be, that keep us out of these places of danger. God, we thank you that you, uh, that you want this for us, not just to squeeze any fun out of our lives, but because you know where our weaknesses are, you know where we get ourselves in trouble. You know what the end of the story looks like. And so I pray that you help us to make some good decisions when it comes to setting up some guardrails in our lives. And, and God, there, there's some of us here, man, we have just plowed through those guardrails. God, I thank you that you give us the opportunity for a fresh start. That we can dial it back. That we can uh, be renewed and redeemed and restored. That we can have a fresh start. Maybe you're here today and, and maybe you've never experienced that fresh start at all. Maybe you've never taken the opportunity to, to make a decision to have God at, at, in control of your life. And you're realizing today, you know, I've made so many mistakes and, and I just want to give God the opportunity. If he'll forgive me, if he'll take me back, then, uh, then that's what I want. If you want to do that today, um, we kind of just commemorate the decision with a little prayer. Uh, there's nothing magical about the words, but it just... Uh, expresses the, 
desire and condition of our hearts. So I just want you to pray this prayer, repeat it after me. You're not going to be the only one doing it, so don't worry about that. We're all going to be doing it. So I invite you to repeat after me and pray, Heavenly Father, please forgive me of my sins. Make me brand new. I believe Jesus died for me and he rose again so I could live for you. Fill me with your spirit so I could follow you all the days of my life. Thank you for new life. I give you mine. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, we are so excited that you did. I just invite you either during this last song or or after the service, stop by our yes table in the back corner of the worship center over there. Uh, We have a Bible and some other materials to give you to kind of help you to get started along this journey. So please be sure to do that. Um, During this last song, if you'd like to come up and spend some time in prayer at the altars on either side, you're welcome to do that. Uh, We also have folks that will be stationed along the walls who would love to get a chance to pray with you. Uh, so uh, please be sure to, uh, to do that as well. Maybe you've got some kind of healing need, something going on in your life. Uh, you need physical healing, emotional, whatever the case may be. They would love to get a chance to pray with you. So um, let's just take a few moments as we close our time. Let's lift our hearts up to God. You know, we uh, are called to, to, to shout it. And, and sometimes we do that with our voices. Sometimes we do that with our lives. I was kind of just reminded, uh, I told you the story earlier in the series about uh, being away at college, University of Alabama, my first year, and everybody else around me was drinking, and, and I just didn't, I didn't know how to handle it. And, and, and it took me a while, and finally I was able to, to hang out with them while not crossing that line and develop some, some connections there. And I'll just never forget in, in that, that last day of, of the semester as folks were packing up and leaving, I can't tell you how many people came up and said, hey, you know what? I really respected you for being different from everybody else, for, for not just kind of giving in and going with the flow. And, and, and so whatever you believe, man, it, 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 it's something. And, and it was so encouraging and to know that, that, that I had shouted it, but with my life and not just with my words and my wagging finger. And, and so I got a chance to, by making that decision, by drawing that line, by having that guardrail, it not only impacted my life and kept me in a safe place, but it gave that an opportunity to reach out and, and influence the lives of others as well. And so as, as you go forth today, go and, and shout it that, that he is God. Shout it with your, with your voice, but more importantly, shout it with your life. The decisions that you make, the way that you interact with people around you, the, the way that you set up those guardrails to keep yourself safe, to keep you away from the edge of disaster. Not, not that God wants to squeeze all the fun out of your life, but that instead that he wants to, to keep you in a place of safety and protection. And so go in his name. Amen. We'll see you next week.